Certainly good to see you today. Praise the Lord. Glad you're here to worship with us. I'll be sharing with you a passage out of 2 Kings chapter 7. You can open your Bibles there. We'll go to it in just a moment. Uh, in, a, in a message, uh, a two-part message, really. I just not be able to get it all in today. There's so much in this little passage on uh, moving from the loser in life to the leader in life. Now, let me say this about leadership. I believe that every Christian who's going to live for Jesus, be filled with the Spirit, walk in his power and his might in the life is ultimately destined for leadership all right uh, i believe that god has called us to that place as we've, we've said before we're the light of the world because christ lives in us we're the salt of the earth that means that we are the agents of change which means that if we're going to live for jesus we're going to be thrust out in places to lead and sometimes we we don't even realize it in fact all too many christians are just kind of sitting on the sidelines instead of leading where the lord would have them to lead instead of making a difference would, where God would have them to make a difference. So the context of this message falls in the line of that for the most part. In fact, I did a series on leadership many years ago on Wednesday nights, and this is one of the messages that I include in that. And it might seem like kind of an unlikely message if you're familiar with the passage because it deals with some guys who are lepers. But it really gives us an illustration how that God takes the things which is the outcast of, 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 of a culture and of society, and they become the difference makers in the whole of what's going on. Now, the, the scenario is that God is judging the nation of Israel in this passage, and they are surrounded by the enemy, and famine has come. No, nobody has anything to eat, and you, know, you see God moving in a real sovereign way in the nations over this, but at the same time, this really should show you something that's so unique about the glory of God and the, the majesty of God and the great grace of God is that not only is he working on this universal scale, all things are in his hands, all right? He's the mighty God, the omnipotent, omniscient God over all things. He is personally involved in the lives of these lepers at the same time. Personally involved in your life at the same time. That's just the majesty. It's, it's the wonder of God. It's that part about God that's just so incredible. We can't wrap our minds about, uh, around it, that he's, he's concerned about the nations, the world, the globe, the universe, and eternity. But at the same time, he would have his attention turned to any of us is just mind-blowing. It's just boggling to our minds. Amen? At least it is for me. Maybe you think that you deserve that much attention. I'm not sure. <laughs> But in 2 Kings, we'll look at this passage as we look at it in chapter 7. If you'll stand with me as we re honor the reading of the Word this morning. 2 Kings chapter 7, we'll start with verse 3. If you don't have your scriptures open, you can obviously read it upon the screen. It says, Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why do we sit here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, then famine is in the city. We'll die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we'll live. If they kill us, we're just going to die anyway. <laughs> it's context there. Verse 5 says, And they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans. And when they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and the sound of horses and the sound of a great army. So that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Therefore they arose, and they fled in the twilight. They left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp just as it was, and fled for their life. When these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered into one tent, and they ate, and they drank, and carried from there silver and gold and clothes, and they went and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent, and carried from there also, and went and hid them. And they said to one another, We are not doing right. This is the day of good news, but we're keeping silent. If we wait until morning, the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. Amen, and God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Some things I want to draw in, obviously, from this story, that, uh, things that we catch right away, are, these are leprous men. If you're familiar with the, the Old Testament or even the New Testament and leprosy, these were the outcast of the culture. These were the outcast of society. They couldn't enter in to the, the community and the fellowship of the community. Because of their disease, they were marked, basically, as being un, you know, people that you're not going to socialize with, people you're not going to communicate with, and people you're not going to fellowship with. You're, you, you live in tents on the outside of the city gates. You don't experience the protection of, of, the, of the community. You're out there, you're exposed, you're defeated. Now the nation itself, remember, as we said, is an abject 
poverty. The conditions are horrible. No one has any food to eat. A loaf of bread sells for, for, for gold. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous how much famine has entered the land. But if you study the whole story, it was prophesied by the prophets that this would come to this place and this time. And here they are living in the consequences of their sin. Now, if you're this poor leper, the only way you had any kind of substance for your life is you depended uh, tremendously on the people of the community to have mercy, to come give you some food, or family members that you knew who would seek to take care of you in your condition. You were just rejected. You, you were the guy that if you had to walk in amongst the community, you had to yell as you went, unclean, unclean. Some said they had to carry bells and ring them and then say unclean so that people didn't come in to physical contact with you. These, these are, you know, if you, the best you can put it in, in the context of our message is these are the guys and the people, these were rejected men. But here's what I want you to catch in this message about being what God's called you to be. We've talked about being a conqueror. We've talked about being champions. This is, this is the difference we're going to see in this message and, and in the principles of this message, the difference from being the chump and moving to the place of the champ, from being the loser and, and being someone who actually now God is using, not just experiencing a blessing in your own life, you'll see that's what happened with them, but then being that kind of person who's going to move and initiate things in his life so that other people are ultimately blessed because of your life as well. We certainly lost sight of that in the culture that we're living in. This is the me generation, all right? This is about self. This is about promotion of self. No matter what network, what TV, what talk show, what newscast, it all seems to be about you being the best you can be, you know? You... Uh, promoting yourself and you above all others because how can you ever reach others if you don't reach yourself first? Now, you've heard me say it before. I, I, I think that's one of the biggest problems we're facing. When we begin to promote ourselves over and above and against everything else, and all things can suffer at the cost of ourselves and meeting our needs, then certainly we've missed the message of the gospel. You know, Jesus said if anyone's going to come after me, he has to deny himself. That's not the gospel. Uh, that's the gospel message, but that's not the gospel of the age. That's not the message of the world that we're living in today. Today's message is make the most of yourself. And then they pervert the passage that says, you know, love, love others as yourself. And they pervert it by treating it this way. What that passage is teaching, they say, is you need to really promote yourself and really love yourself and really meet your needs and take care of yourself. Then you love others that way. Uh, the, the issue that's being brought in that passage that Jesus is telling us is, is not that we have a problem with loving ourselves. We're born with selfishness in our heart. We're born with selfish desires. We, we don't need to be instructed to encourage that at all. We, we need to come to the place where we deny ourselves and we take up the cross. And these men were experiencing a real level. They, they didn't have to certainly take a humble look upon themselves. They were already dejected and rejected. You remember as a child playing in the playgrounds? and they gather all the kids together and say, let's play ball, or whatever it would be, soccer, basketball, whatever, and then two kids would take the, uh, the opportunity to divide everybody up. You're on my team, or you're on my team, or you're on my team, or you're on my team. You ever get picked last? That's a pretty despondent feeling. I, 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 for some reason, I always thought I was a great athlete. I never got picked first, you know? I guess that kind of proved I wasn't as good as I thought I was. But it was always towards the end when I would get picked. That's kind of despondent. But how'd you like to not be picked at all? That's these guys. They wouldn't even get picked in the playground. They wouldn't even get to go to the playground. They're the outcast. They're the rejected people. Now, understand, this ultimately, I think the best symbolic analogy you give here in Scripture is this, what is obviously laid out and explained in Scripture, that this leprosy in type and in symbol is a picture of sin. And just as the lepers are rejected, and just as the lepers are outside the camp, and just as the lepers are without the blessing, without the protection, so are all of us who do not know Christ Jesus personally. The Bible says that Jesus took upon our sins so that we could be accepted in Him. In fact, in Colossians, it makes a, a, a tremendous statement about how that we are accepted in the Beloved. How that in Jesus Christ, you're accepted. It doesn't matter about your athletic prowess, all right? It doesn't matter about what you might look like or not might look like. It hasn't got anything to do with it. It has everything to do with the love, the mercy, and the grace of God. Now, he can receive you like that because he's offered and paid for the price that was required for your sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? death. So what does Jesus do? He dies. Hebrews puts it this way, that he goes without the camp, all right? That's where the lepers were. That was the symbolism of it all, that he became leprous 
because we were lepers. He became sin because we were sinners. And he takes that upon himself. And you don't want to miss that message because you'll never be what God wants you to be. And you'll never be, I believe, ultimately what you really in your heart want to be. All right? You know there's something missing when you live a life without God, when you live a life without Jesus, and you try to satisfy it in a lot of different ways, but you'll never find the satisfaction. I shared in our first service a little bit of my testimony about it. it seems that I thought there were so many different things in my life that I needed to really be complete or to really find happiness. And so I began the process of searching like everyone seems to do. We look for it in relationships or in popularity. You, you might look for it in a girlfriend or boyfriend. You might look for it in a relationship uh, to, in, in the world on some level. You, you might look for it in success. You might look for it on, on uh, climbing the social ladder and being accepted on a certain level. You might look for it in money. You might look for it in career. You might look for it in drugs. You might look for it in alcohol. People always think something else is going to add you know, to, to their life and find the answer that they're really looking for about what life is really all about. But those things are like dead-end alleys. You just run up one dead-end alley and you run into another dead-end alley and time after time, you keep finding, that's not the answer, that's not the answer, that's not the answer. Uh, you could take a quick read of the book of Ecclesiastes and you'll see it's exactly what Solomon did. Vanity, vanity, it, put it this way, the Joram's translation, it's just a waste of time. It's a vain effort to find life anywhere outside the one who gives life, all right? It's just not going to be found there. And so these lepers really give us a clear picture of what our life is without God and how we're separated from God and we're separated from hope. And we're separated from answers. But when we come to Christ, how he brings fullness, how he brings life, and as he said, I bring that life more abundantly. So here are these guys. They're sitting on the outside of the camp. They're unclean. They're leprous. They're rejected by the world around them until things begin to change. Let me tell you when the changes start in your life, when you realize the futility of trying to find life without God, trying to find life and substance without Jesus Christ. That's where your starting point is. That's where you come to the place where you kind of get ultimately just to the absolute end of yourself. And you recognize that the problems of your life are mostly self-induced. You quit blaming others. You quit blaming parents. You quit blaming your circumstance. You quit blaming your situation. And you take some ownership in your life. And these guys, let's put it in the terminology uh, of uh, the President Trump likes to use. It's accurate in this point. These guys are losers. You, know, you can't lose any more than where they are. They're at the bottom of the bottom, and nobody can help them. Even those who desire to help them can't help them because of the famine. They're at the bottom of the barrel. By the way, have you ever been there? I've visited. <laughs> you know, you all know the, the principle of holes, right? The principle of pits is pretty simple. If you're in one, quit digging. <laughs> you get to the bottom. Don't try to start digging deeper. It's time to look up. And these guys give us a clear and accurate picture of someone who's just like that. But God doesn't work here in these guys, and we see the infinite grace of God because I don't believe any of us really ever really look for answers until we start really looking to see that there's got to be something outside ourselves to resolve the problem other than what's in this world. And so there's this point of despair. There's this point of depression. And, and you can see it because they said, we're going to die here. If we stay here, leaning against this wall, we're going to die here. And they say, well, you know, well, yeah, well, I guess we're just going to die here. Then another time, say, hey, we, w w what if we go to the camp of the Arameans? Guy number three pops up, they'll kill us. So we're going to die anyway, is the response. Whether we go there or stay here, we could die. But it could be they might show mercy on us, and we could have an, a, an answer to, that we're looking for. I mean, we, here it is. We've got nothing to lose. I've got nothing to lose. And I've not, I mean, I can't lose anymore. I've already lost, I've already lost everything, so I've nothing. You ever been there? I came to that place, at, and I've been there more than once, but I, I came to that place, the most significant time was at the ripe old age of 21 when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I had nothing to lose. It's all gone anyway. And what I did have was empty, and it was meaningless, and there was no substance to it whatsoever. And when you run down all those dead ends, you discover that if you listen and look close enough and hard enough, there's the grace of God standing right there at the end of every one of those dead end alleys. That he's there to meet you. But we don't want that. We reject that, and so we run down another avenue until we exhaust all that. There's going to come a time that you're going to say, this is useless. 
what have I got to lose? I mean, I've, I've been in, in enough services and enough revivals and crusades and church services like this to, to, to be able to read people's faces at a lot of different times. And the, you can see them as the Spirit of God begins to, to deal with them. And he, God has such a unique way of speaking to every one of our hearts, you know. You know, I could be preaching on volleyball and you're thinking about heaven and hell, you know. <laughs> Just the, you understand the context there is that the Holy Spirit's going to work on you no matter what the sermon is. And you could be preaching on stewardship in the church and tithing, and the guy over here is lost. It's got to deal with him about his salvation, you know, and the stewardship of his life. But I've, I've I noticed because, and I know this because I, I've had to deal with this in my own heart and life, especially before coming to Christ, is you kind of start weighing things out. Well, I'd have to leave this, or I'd have to stop that. If I have to get under Jesus, I can't do that anymore. Well, I think it's time you kind of take a closer look at what that's offering you. What has that done for you? Whatever that is, what has it really given you? It's really made a difference. How's that working out, that whatever it is? I think if you're honest enough, you'll say, well, I just keep doing that and that and that. It still hadn't offered me anything. There's no, no satisfaction in it. There's just no life in it. These guys come to the point that at the end of their desperation, they say, well, maybe, maybe we ought to do something. At the end of all that we're dealing with, you know, what's going to have to happen here? I think what happens to happen is what has to happen in every one of our lives. We get to this point of reasoning. You know, the Bible says, come, let us reason together in Isaiah chapter 1. God said, hey, I want you to think about this. Really, honestly, where you're at, where I'm calling to you, and where you are and where you've been. You get to this place where no longer, you know, you, you, you're just sitting in your rejection and despair. You get to this place where you're going to take some time for reasoning. I, I used when I taught this on leadership was that, that leaders will utilize discernment. These guys are exercising some reason here and some discernment here. What is it? Why sit here till we die? You say, that's not a lot of discernment. But if you haven't been there, what do you know? <laughs> you know? we got to come to that place in our life. If I keep doing what I'm doing, living the way I'm living, acting the way I'm acting, moving the direction I'm moving in, making the choices that I'm making in, things haven't changed yet, I'm just going to die if I keep doing this. And so there's this ultimate sense of this biblical reasoning of Isaiah 1. It says, hey, think about where you're at today. Think about what you're doing today. Think about the actions that you're going through and the decisions that you're making. If you're going to be anything that God desires for you to be, and we've seen all the lofty things, and they are lofty, that the Bible presents to us about being overcomers, all right? About being victors, about being champions, about, about, about being the winners, about being the, the difference makers. If you're going to be all those things, you're going to have to come to this place to realize that all the stuff that's hindering you from that is hindering you, and it's not helping you. Where is this... Where's the discernment of the age? Where's the logic of the age? Where's the reason of the age? We see it all around us. We see the Santa Fe shootings and Columbine and all the others. They're just insane, are they not? Or they're just not reasonable. But somebody, somewhere in a lone room by themselves thought, hey, this is a reasonable thing to go do. That's the insanity of sin. That's the ridiculousness of living in the darkness and not in light. And so you get to this place in your own life of desperation to do something and to make a choice. There's not a lot of choices that are offered here, but they're saying, hey, we have nothing left to lose. When's the last time you took a real honest assessment of where you were in your life? A real honest overview, so to say, you know, of, of, of what's really going on in your life. I think to all too often, we don't do that. Because we live in this little world of, well, it's denial. It's the only word you could use here. And denial is what? It's, it's, it's to refute the reality. It's to refute fact. We talk about denial in people's lives who are in habits and addictions and strongholds of their life, all different kinds, you know, and, and they reason and they rationalize. You say, you know, why do they do that? It has to do with the human ego. All right? None of us wants to feel like we're not meeting the mark. None of us wants to feel like we're living below the standard of, of what a good life is. And so when we get caught in bondage and we get caught in sin and we get caught in, in, in the trials of our life, we begin to justify to ourselves, well, this is important for me because, or I have to do this because, and I know what culture says, or I know what the Bible says, and I know what the moral standards, but in my situation, that really doesn't apply because that's just denial. That's just, that's choosing to live a lie. That's choosing to just fabricate your own world and your own story to fit because you don't want to be honest with yourself. 
because we all want to be better than what we are. That's just a natural thing, amen? We all want a, a better standard, a, a better life. And so instead of coming to that, we rationalize why we're not there, we justify it, and then not only do we lie to ourselves, that pours out to that we lie to people we care about. We lie to people we love, people that mean everything in the world to us, and people who are being lied to, and they find, well, you lied to me, you don't care me. No, they, listen, they've lost context of what it means, truth. They've lost the context. And that's where prayer comes in. That's where encouragement comes in. That's where conf confrontation sometimes comes in. But the idea is if, if we're just lying to ourselves, we don't have any hope. And these guys are not lying to themselves. They're not sitting around saying, oh, it's, it's going to be better tomorrow. It's not going to be better tomorrow. Somebody will bring food tomorrow. <laughs> There's no food. Somebody's going to help us tomorrow. There's no help coming. And the best place any of us can ultimately get to in our life is to get down to that place of just saying, hey, you know, I, there's no other place to go to but God. But as long as we just think we're everything, and long everything's okay, and long as we've justified and rationalized, you know, uh, having an estimation of yourself that's up here is always trouble. Amen? We think too highly of ourselves. Scripture says not to do that. I mean, it's kind of like if you took a little history, you know, for me, with the Battle of Waterloo, you know, where, where the famous Battle of Waterloo took place and Napoleon Barnaparts there. And the battle is getting ready to take place the next, that, that day. And he's at an early breakfast with his generals. And he's, he's, his, his famous last words are, I tell you, Wellington, that general, he is a bad general. And the English, they're terrible soldiers. We'll settle this matter by lunch. Well, maybe not. <laughs> and all too often, we have this high estimation of ourselves until some situation occurs in our life that brings us back not to our world of reality, but to reality. And this is where the problem often begins. We're just not really honest with ourselves, therefore we don't move forward. At least these guys are being honest. There's just no help around. There's no answers for this, you know. You say, well, Brother Joe, it doesn't seem like a great deal of discernment involved there, you know. Let me tell you. Ultimately, when the rest of the nation is having something to eat, these guys are heroes. These guys are the most discerning people in the world. These guys are geniuses because the need's been met. But I truly believe real discernment, and that discernment, you know, is that, that capacity to, to make wise decisions, that, that, to look into a situation, to see a scenario before you and make the righteous and the right choice and all those kind of things. Discernment is to, to, to see behind the scenes, so to say. We've been going through Proverbs on many Wednesday nights. We talk about wisdom being the capacity, you know, to, to, to make wise choices and to, to understand situations, not as they present themselves, but as they really are. It's kind of, you're able to pull the curtain back on what's really going on. Uh, I think parents are given a measure of discernment when it comes to their kids, amen? I think that, that, that you as a husband are given a measure of discernment. You as a wife are given a measure of discernment. We're all given levels of discernment, but we have to grow in that, and we have to, have to mature in that. Hebrews 5, 4 says, you know, that strong meat belongs to those, those who are mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. What's that mean? In other words, you learn to be discerning by being discerning. You learn to make the right choice by making the right choice. You learn to be able to judge a situation by judging the situation. It's kind of like you learn to walk by walking. Yeah, you crawled, you stumbled, you fell at times, but you kept walking, you kept working, and now you walk. The idea is here, it's through reason of use, as the book of Hebrews puts it. But what happens, sin clouds our capacity to genuinely see things as, as the way that God really sees them, which is reality. We just don't see reality. But we're looking through, 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 through dark glasses. There's a great passage in Malachi where the Lord's talking to his people, and he's telling them to repent, and if they would repent, that he'd give them this ability to discern. It says here in Malachi 3, it says, And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, and that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. And then what he says is, Then you shall return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that does not serve God. What's he saying? When you come back to me, you're going to be able to see things properly. You're going to be able to see things rightly. And how many of us in our life were so confused about choices that we need to make in our life? And some of you are presented with some very difficult things right now in your life. And some very difficult places in your life right now. And what you need is the ability to see those things from a biblical and a godly perspective. How does God want you to look at them? All too often we don't do that. And instead of walking in faith and victory, we walk in fear, 
We walk in doubt, depression, worry. Those things plague us because we haven't seen the way, it, the way that God wants us to see it yet. And he says, hey, when my people come back to me, then I'm going to give them the ability to see the situation. Boy, there's this great passage. It's one that we did when we were studying Proverbs. In, Pro- in Proverbs chapter 2, in verse 6 through 10, it says, For the Lord gives wisdom. So, if, by the way, if you're looking for wisdom, it comes from the Lord. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice. He preserves the way of his godly ones. Now catch this in verse 9. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity and every good course. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. What's he saying here? Wisdom's found in the Lord. And with that wisdom comes the ability to understand. I'll give you knowledge. I'll give you understanding about it. I mean, there's a lot of things that come up to us and we see it, but we just don't understand it. You you may be in a deal right now. You see it, you don't understand it. Wisdom will come from the Lord. And when you come to the Lord and you seek His face, you know what happens? He begins to give you wisdom. He begins to give you understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for who? The upright. So you come to the place to get right with God. He said, then he becomes the shield for those who walk in integrity. In other words, if I choose his will, choose his way, come to him, he shows me what needs to be done, and even though it may look dangerous to do what it needs to be done, it may look difficult, he gives me what I need. He even becomes a guard for me. He even preserves my way. So what's he saying? Listen, you've got this covered if you do it God's way. God's going to do for you what needs to be done if you'll come to him and lean on him and hear him and respond to him the way he wants you to do. He says, then you can discern. Then you're going to have the capacity to see things the way they need to be seen, to understand the things that are really going on in your life. I I don't know about you, there's been times I've just almost cried before saying, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't understand this. Why, Lord? And then to begin to quit the why part and start moving towards him with a heart of worship, with a heart of praise, with a heart of pursuit, to embrace Him first. Instead of seeking the Word first, start seeking Him first, and then the Word comes. Then the wisdom comes. I love it. He says, you'll be able to discern righteousness and justice and equity and, look at this, every good course. You're going to know the steps you need to take. You're going to, need the, you're going to see the choices that need to be made when you make those kind of decisions. What's going to happen? Wisdom is going to enter your heart. And that knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Some of you are looking at things that God's leading you to. You say, it's not pleasant. I don't like that. I don't want to hear that. Because you don't see it from the perspective God wants you to see it from. I mean, listen, first thing I didn't want to do was become a Christian. But when I came to the Lord, that's the most wonderful thing that ever happened in my life. Add to that, on my list of what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to be a Christian, and I'm not going to preach. <laughs> and now I love it. I wouldn't do anything. Hey, I don't think I could do anything unless the job for janitor is open. All right, I'll do that. I can, work, I can handle that. You know? But you know, it becomes good. Ezekiel's a great illustration of this. The Lord, Ezekiel's prophesying that the Lord handed me a scroll, and I looked at it, and it was bitter until I took it in, and, and it became sweet, like honey. Now listen, the first look at the Word of God is always a bitter taste. Isn't it kind of, I don't know if I can do that, I don't know if I want to do that, I don't know if I like that. I, 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 God, I don't think that's me. You don't even know you. You really don't even know you until you come to God and know Him. Then He helps you understand who you are. Everybody's trying to find themselves. Well, find Jesus, you'll see yourself in there. You know, don't get the cart before the horse. You look for Jesus, and he begins to show you the right way, the, the equitable way, the right choice to make. Why sit there till you die? Why live in despondency? Why live in despair one moment longer? I think this, the issue of discernment comes like this. When you're, you're down to nothing, that's when God is up to something. When you get down, when there's just nothing. That's when you can begin to discover that God is up to something. And maybe you're feeling like that in your life. I just, where, you know, just what from here, what to do here. Listen, God's doing something in your life. And so you turn to him. Now, I like what it says here, you know, it says, uh, why well, sit here till we die? And verse 5 gives the key. He says, and then they, they rose up. 
They became men of resolution. Let's do something. Amen. Let's exercise some initiative. Leaders, let me say, spirit-filled Christians always exercise initiative. You're not sitting around waiting for somebody else to do something. You're going to do it. You're not waiting for somebody else to give you another good idea. Listen, there's so many people in churches with good ideas and not enough people to go carry out any idea whatsoever. Amen? Amen. Everybody's got something the church ought to do. Church ought to be doing this. Church ought to be doing this. Church ought to be doing this. But what are you doing? You know? What are you doing? You know? And, and, and I, I get mocked for saying this sometimes, all right? Don't go to Brother Joe. He's going to tell you if you quit thinking. Don't come up with an idea unless you're ready to do it. That's a good line whether you believe it or not. If God put it on your heart, if you can see that need, why is God showing it to you? Well, I, got, I don't got time to do that. Then sit there at the city gate for a little longer. <laughs> when the sores start coming up, <laughs> it's time to make a decision. It's time to move on. What are we going to say? And they rose up. They got up. They did something about it. There came a point in your life, if you know Jesus, there came a point in your life, you said, there has to be something better than the way I'm living, right? There's got to be something better than this. And if you read through the book of Hebrews, that's the theme of the book of Hebrews, something better, something better, something better. God has provided something better, a better offering, a better sacrifice, a better life, a better future, a better covenant. It's all there. Because this is the way God works in our life. But until we get to the place to realize, you know, that, hey, there's got to be something better and move out of our complacency, we're never going to, we're never going to move forward. John Maxwell does a lot of leadership training courses, made this statement. He said, listen, of all things that leaders should fear, complacency, she head the list. I just don't want to be complacent in my Christian life. I want to be complacent in my walk with God. I don't want to be complacent. I, I, I don't want to be content. And, and I do believe, listen to me, I believe God brings us to these places of desperation like this so that, that we'll get out of our states of contentment. You know? And all too often, we're just, I, I think maybe we're just not ever, we don't ever let desperation set in. And if you don't let desperation set in, then you have to deal with the stage before desperation. What is that? Well, it starts like this. Here comes situation. And the situation usually brings some kind of conflict that should bring us to the place of desperation. But all too often, we settle back here in mediocrity and say, well, there's just no hope and there's no way. And so getting all the way to desperation where deliverance can come from, we stop up here at depression or despair. What's the use? What's the use? And there's no joy, there's no victory, there's no life, there's no challenge, and you're never changed. And listen to me, nothing is going to change in your life until we get this, this attitude of desperation and take these drastic, drastic, challenging steps in our life to do something. And the something becomes clear, I believe, sometimes just by sheer logic, there's nothing else for these guys to do. And sometimes, folks, it's just pretty clear what you need to do. I mean, the Holy Spirit's just been almost, and he doesn't yell, but it seems like that. <laughs> it's been it's speaking it to your spirit, and speak, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. But we don't want to hear that. And so we just say, well, God's not meeting me here. Well, maybe it's time to take some initiative and rise up because he's been leading you, you just haven't been hearing and responding. I mean, just as, just as a simple question here, when's the last time you initiated something significant in your life, spiritually speaking first? When's the last time you really initiated something really significant in your spiritual walk? Perhaps you say, well, I remember when I did this and this and this. Where's that today even? Maybe it was a spiritual discipline in your life, like prayer or time in the Word of God or that, that all-important evidence of leadership, winning people to Christ, sharing the gospel with folks, evangelism, telling people the good news. That's the lesson these guys go to, and that's the lesson we see a little later in this. This is not, he said, we're, we're just gorged to the hilt here and going tent to tent. This is not good that we keep all this to ourselves. It's not good that we keep it all to ourselves because we're going to find ourselves back at the gate sooner or later Amen. in despair. I've always thought that the way that the Holy Spirit works in our life is so unique and so, 
I mean, just the way that God has the capacity. When you come to Jesus, that you get these spiritual ears and these spiritual eyes. Why? Because the Spirit now lives in you. And that God has committed to the Holy Spirit who lives in you a responsibility. And the responsibility of the Holy Spirit, He's to guide you. He's to lead you. He's to teach you. He's to correct you. He's to encourage you. But all too often, we just go, grow deaf to that. And we don't hear God speaking to us anymore. We hear all the external noises. We wonder why we make such poor choices and end up in such bad places. It's all too often we just keep shutting God out. If you stay where you're at, what's going to come of that? Nothing. It's time to move forward. Now, it's not a blind move here. There's an act of faith towards someone, and it's the Lord. Because he tells us very clearly, you seek me first. Seek me first. Seek me first. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Seek me first. And what happens? He'll take care of the rest. Yes. And all too often, we're too busy seeking the rest instead of seeking God in his kingdom. Let's stand together with our heads bowed. We'll continue this message a little bit more next week. But I believe as we come to the Lord in this moment, in this time, that he's probably spoken so clearly to us, we don't need any more sermon. We need to respond to what the Holy Spirit has said to us. And I would encourage you today, as the Spirit of God has spoken to you, that you take ownership of what he said to you. You believe what he said to you. But with every word that he speaks to us, there's obviously some component of obedience in our life where we, as it said in verse 5, we have to rise up and make a decision. So their heads bowed this morning and our hearts open to the Lord. We're going to give an invitation today. If you're here first and foremost, if you don't know Jesus, are you going to stay that way? Because if you die that way, there's no hope later. Your hope is now and your hope is today. It's by choosing Christ Jesus. And you can come to any of these men this altar this morning and say, I want to give my life to Christ. He'll be glad to shout and share with you <laughs> about what it means to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and lead you in making the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. If you're here as a Christian this morning, God spoke to your spirit and your heart about this message, and I would encourage you to come find a place at this altar. Why sit there till you die? Make a choice. Volitionally, step out from where you're standing. Let that be an act and a symbol of your commitment to the Lord in this regard in your life. And between you and him, just come find a place to pray up here and get it right with God today. Make the decision you need to make in your life. If you're looking for a church home, you believe this is where the Lord's been leading you, you come today. Say, I want to be a part of what God's doing here. I want to be, I want to be involved in how the Spirit's operating and what his, his work is here. If there's some other need in your life, you just want someone to pray with you and bring some of the altar with you, or come and pray with any of us. We'll be glad to pray with you. You come in Jesus' name. You step out now. Let's trust the Lord together. Come.